Welcome to the NCDWI Guy podcast, where defenders of the Constitution assemble to prepare for courtroom battle, and firm owners gather to develop marketing strategies that will revolutionize the practice of criminal defense. Here's your host, the NCDWI Guy, Jake Minnick. Hello, fellow freedom fighters, and welcome to episode 198 of the NC DWI Guy podcast. Buckle up for a fun episode. On today's podcast, I have Dan Hatley, the managing attorney of iTicket, on the show to talk all things business of criminal and traffic defense law. Just a blast of a conversation. Dan and I had the pleasure of meeting a couple of months back. He came to, to Asheville and uh, we had the opportunity to go out for lunch. A um, few weeks ago, we got to uh, have lunch in his neck of the woods down in Chapel Hill. And also I had the grand privilege of getting a inside scoop tour of the iTicket uh, firm facility, major facility in um, Chapel Hill. Um, walking into iTicket, and, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit on the uh, on the in the conversation with Dan. But walking into iTicket literally uh, felt like I was walking into the future of law, like I was walking into the the futuristic law firm. I felt like I was uh, in the, in the Jetsons show, so to speak. You know, like that. This this is where the legal space is heading. Um, truly, an incredible space that is the iTicket headquarters in Chapel Hill. And I am so grateful uh, that I, I had the opportunity to be uh, kind of shown shown the behind the scenes of uh, iTicket's facilities. Um, it's it's really an amazing thing in terms of, of how uh, technology is being used in the legal space to change the way that we can deliver our services to the client. And there's no company currently in North Carolina utilizing technology better from a criminal defense practice standpoint than iTicket. And so it is just a uh, amazing opportunity to have Dan on the podcast to talk with us about the future of criminal defense and utilizing technology in your law practice Hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Well, Dan, I'm pumped about our conversation. It's been a blast getting to know you here over the past few months, getting to have lunch together a couple of times and, and getting the grand tour of the wildly impressive iTicket space that you guys have in Chapel Hill. So I really, really appreciate you uh, giving me the uh, the inside look at the office a couple of weeks back. And uh, again, just been, been a blast talking to you. So I'm so excited to talk business and law. Yeah. Thank you very much for having, having me on today. And I appreciate the opportunity to come and, you know, speak to your followers um, and also just to continue the conversation that we had in, in uh, Chapel Hill a few weeks ago. And then uh, that we started off when we met uh, in Asheville last summer. So uh, thank you again for coming down. We really appreciated you stopping by and it was just always fun to, get people a tour of our space. Oh, it was a blast. I think it was one of those, uh, I got to go a, um, probably right at about a year ago. I think it was last, last January. I got to go and visit Brian King's, um, uh, uh, intake center. He calls it the dojo tra training center at his office. And that was, um, I described going there and then, uh, his, his, uh, office in that space in Rutherford is in like an old bank building and his specific office is in the vault. And it's really pretty, pretty cool, pretty cool looking. And so I, uh, I described that as like the Willy Wonka experience, like getting to go through the chocolate factory. Like it was just this, this awesome tour. And, um, when I walked into iTicket, it literally was like walking into the future of law, like a futuristic law firm because of the design and thought that you guys had put into, you know, creating a, a space 
where your culture can flourish among your team um, and, and being really thoughtful about having rooms for for meeting and and how um, uh, all of your uh, kind of intake team desks are laid out, desks in certain spaces for people that are there, you know, kind of dedicated desks for people that are kind of working in like a semi virtual uh, capacity. I mean, it was, it was just awesome. I mean, it was really like walking through. Um, I know, I know you, you describe uh, you guys sometimes as a tech company that does law and that's what it felt like. I mean, you definitely like have, have uh, uh, you know, created that space and I got some sweet, you know, swag. I got my eye ticket, my eye ticket uh, hat and t-shirt. It was like literally like going on a tour and it was, it was really impressive. So again, I really appreciate you guys not only showing me the space, but also kind of explaining the reasons behind kind of how you have designed the physical space of the firm, which I think in a lot of ways sets the tones uh, for the culture. So um, yeah, re really can't thank you enough for that opportunity. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming. And and we'll talk a little bit more about culture, I think later on in the conversation yes. we can, and get into that, but there's an intentionality about uh, culture. You know, you have to think about it from just the office design, desk set up and everything. Uh, you have to make people feel good about coming into a workplace. Um, you know, the, the type of work we do, um, you know, specifically I ticket, we handle traffic tickets. It's not, you know, rocket science, but um, the clients on the other side of the phone, you know, for them, it may be the most important thing they have all year long. Yes. And they really require that level of attention. And sometimes they're, you know, they're, they're really anxious about the situation. And so uh, while it's not, uh, you know, we're not doing corporate trademarks or anything like that, um, you know, people are anxious, we've got to keep them calm. And so to do that, we want to have an intentional, you know, calmness to our space as well. Yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. And I think, uh, again, in, in comparing, you know, the kind of feeling that a client has getting a speeding ticket to, you know, a, a business that is applying for a trademark or a patent, again, that might be a lot more complex potentially in terms of like, how do you get there? But, you know, businesses that have been through that before, it may just be like, you know, we don't care, you know, like, you, you know, go do your thing. Whereas, you know, client that's got that speeding ticket, maybe like you just said, just, you know, life has kind of all of a sudden shut down, feeling like depressed, you know, uh, can't believe I got myself into this situation. And so, yeah, I mean, definitely can be, be a big deal for, for clients. So I, I think it's really cool to have that intentionality. So, well, I, I guess, you know, uh, I got to see, kind of the the current state of of iTicket but um you know tell me how you go from a firm of one to what is now iTicket what does that process look like first of all like what what is the current size of iTicket from a uh, personnel standpoint so right now we're at uh, 29 attorneys across the state uh, we're operating in 93 counties um, That's we have amazing. around 55 administrative staff supporting our attorneys uh, so not not quite uh, two to one ratio, but, but fairly close to that. Yeah, that's amazing. so. It, you know, we're not. You know, there's not there are that many statistics out there, but we're one of the largest criminal defense practices in the state. So yeah, I, I would uh, but, I would be shocked if there is a larger one that does only criminal defense. I, I I cannot imagine that there's anybody else out there that rivals that level. Um, so yeah, no, that's a, a, a just amazing. Like, I mean, so impressive. So yeah. How do you get from, uh, from Dan Hatley to, to that many, to that many people and what you guys have built? Yeah. And, you know, I prepared some notes, uh, for our conversation, Jake. And so, uh, you know, let me know if I'm not speaking, uh, off the cuff enough, but, um, you know, we talked about in, in the lead up to, uh, the podcast today, you know, big, the, some of the biggest drivers Yes, and I was trying to yep. think about it and I, and, and really it, it seemed to me more like a snowball effect. So there weren't necessarily, you know, I couldn't necessarily tick off two, three, four things that were just the it things that, that turned it from a solo practice into what it is now. Uh, there were just a lot of little things that kind of uh, continued to give speed to that snowball and size to that snowball as it went down the hill. Um, but I did, I did put together uh, just a few things that I thought were, you know, major focuses for us that, that I thought have really paid off in, in the long run. And um, some of those are, you know, our focus on client expectations and uh, sticking to what we do best. 
um, and then emphasis on training and leaning into branding. And so just kind of touching on each of those points um, in order, um, we really have tried to focus on the expectations of the client. And we're going to get more into that as we talk about, you know, technology and how we've le leveraged technology. But um, even at the very beginning, when I opened the solo practice, I, I realized that the consumers in the market, our clients, wanted more than what they were getting. And they wanted more contact with the attorney. They wanted more convenience to the intake sign-up process. And they wanted more peace of mind. And I equate that to transparency in the process. And so uh, I think the thing that we did that was crucial was we recognized that these needs or wants were out there for the market, for the consumer. And then we leaned into those things and tried to fulfill those needs. So, you know, focusing on what the changing expectation of the client was. Um, you know, secondly, uh, I, I'd say we stick to what we do best, right? So we talked about that. We're, we're not a, a traffic ticket, you know, focused law firm that also does personal injury or, you know, whatever else, real estate law on the side. Like we, we don't spread ourselves too thin by trying to do everything under the sun. And we've obviously got, you know, a, a good client base uh, established. So if we wanted to pivot into another area of law, we, we could possibly do that. But at what expense? Yes. So we, we, we don't try to spread ourselves thin by doing things that we aren't great at, you know, so obviously, we're, you know, we're not, we don't call ourselves specialists in traffic law, but that's what we do and what we do best. And so we focus on uh, what we do well. And then um, part of doing what we do well is we have an emphasis on training. And that training is across the board, both our legal assistants and our attorneys. And so both of the both of our uh, classes of employees go through a rigorous training process upon hiring and then throughout their employment with iTicket, we're constantly going through uh, training on new modules, what, what you know, new updates to the iTicket system. And we're constantly evaluating the performance of both our legal assistants and our attorneys. And you saw some of that, you know, when you were at the office a few yeah. days ago. I mean, we've got a tracker that says shows us how long people have been waiting uh, to talk to one of our legal assistants. And so we're constantly looking at these different data points to make sure that we're living up to our own expectations uh, for the service that we're delivering. And then, you know, uh, branding, it, it's something that is, is often, you know, kind of uh, thought of, not thought of or put at the back uh, for attorneys. Everybody gets out of law school and they, they hang out a shingle, the law office of, right? And that's just, that's just the, the normal thing to do. Yes. But from the very beginning, I knew, or at least I felt, that it needed to be more than just Dan Hatley. Dan Hatley's here today, maybe gone tomorrow. You know, I could die. I could die any day. But I, I wanted to set up something that was a constant. And you know, when you think about the big corporations in America, they're not named after their founders. Generally speaking, they're named. They're 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 it's something catchy or something that's descriptive of the service that, that's being provided. And then, you know, once that brand is established, the quality is associated with that brand. And that continues on throughout the life of the corporation. So, um, you know, in terms of focusing on the clients, continuing our, our focus on what we do best, training, branding, these are some of the things that I thought have been really uh, the cornerstones of our success so far. Yeah, d just to dig in a little bit uh deeper into a couple of those points and maybe take you off script here for a second. But first of all, like the, uh, the scoreboard that you guys had down there was just incredible. So just as a comment, um, you know, the, the, the ability to see, you know, how long a client has been on hold to have metrics and target answer times by which somebody gets on the phone, you know, it really is like just a, it's a, culture shift in terms of of legal uh business operation because for such a long time the issue uh that leads to so many bar complaints and 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 you know so many uh you know bad reviews is just communication i cannot get my lawyer to call me back and you know on on uh, the flip side on your end, you're kind of setting this uh, situation up where it's kind of like, you know, not, not only are we, you know, going to be in contact, but we want to do it like as fast as possible. We want to have follow up as fast as possible. We want to be able to track how quickly we are responding. And so, yeah, as, so as soon as, uh, 
we, I, I walked away. I was like, I got to figure something out uh, on that front. So we are in uh, week one of having kind of a, a, a live scoreboard that is not nearly as impressive and beautiful as the one that was, uh, was at the iTicket firm, but just helping us to start tracking some of those, those same metrics. And I mean, just as kudos in terms of, um, you know, how important it is to really pay attention to the client experience at that, at that level. So, so again, yeah, just, just kudos on that front, but to take a little bit of a deeper dive in terms of, you know, uh, from kind of Dan Hatley to I ticket, um, what was kind of like the, um, uh, background, whether business background or like how quickly was it, you know, that you coming out of law school went into traffic ticket defense and then kind of decided, you know, there's something missing here. Like, you know, because again, it seems like you were able to make those connection points relatively early in practice. Hey, I want to really focus on the, uh, the client experience communication. I want to create something that's, you know, kind of bigger than me that I want to brand in a, in a way that makes sense to the end user, you know, uh, moving towards, I take it when again, you know, I, 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 I speak from, uh, from a long period of minic law that, you know, just the normal thing is like, put your name on the, on the firm. And I really think that it's powerful to uh, brand yourself in a, in a more bigger vision way that communicates some of this. So what, what was that kind of like early, early part of practice where it was like, I, I, I think something is missing in the legal market. Was there anything specific yeah, I mean, a lot of it just stemmed out of my own experience. I, I had a little bit of a lead foot when I was in law school <laughs> and, and awesome. college. And uh, so, I, you know, I'd gotten a ticket down in Harnett County um, when I was in, in law school. And I, I hired an attorney and, you know, he did a great job in terms of getting the ticket reduced. But um, after talking with him um, and, and getting him uh, hired, I never heard back from him. And so yeah. there was a, you know, there was a feeling like, Hey, I, I need to be more involved in this process, even though it was, you know, a great, a great reduction. Um, I don't even think I ended up paying any court costs on it. Um, it, it, it just left me feeling wanting, right? Yeah. And in addition, and just to backtrack a little bit, you know, when I got out of law school, it's 2008, uh, started with a small firm in Chapel Hill doing mostly construction litigation. And then the economy just fell out, you know, the bottom fell out of the economy in, two, in 08. And I, I had to go out on my own and I was doing a little bit of this, doing a little bit of that, dabbling in litigation and, and trying to find what my niche was going to be. And I got into uh, traffic law because a friend of mine just said, hey, that, you know, it's something you can get into. It's, it, it's, it can help keep the lights on. Um, I went to district court a time or two and I started to realize how you know, kind of um, detail oriented it was, but also regimented. You know, yeah. if, you, if, you, yeah, yeah. if you knew certain factors about your client, and about the court um, you were operating in, you know, you had a pretty good shot of, of, of knowing how to handle the case. Um, and then district court is, you know, we've, we've talked about it. It's, it's a relationship oriented court. Um, you know, so um, just knowing the right people, knowing, knowing how to, how to, um, um, you know, go through the process effectively. And so I started thinking about, okay, this, this is something that I can, I can get into, I can know it, you know, fairly quickly and, and get on top of it. And then, you start seeing that there's an inefficiency in the market. And we can mm -hmm. talk about this a little bit more, you know, in terms of the technology application, but there was, there was already, you know, just a month or two into the district court practice, uh, a feeling that, Hey, there's something lacking here. It's not just the, on the client side of things. Um, there, there, there's, there's something lacking in the market that we could maybe, maybe disrupt. And this is at the time, you know, where I, you know, iPods are coming out and all kinds of, you know, new technology, Facebook and things like that are, are really starting to pop off. And um, so I start looking at it in a holistic way is like, how can we take advantage of this, you know, fairly regimented area of, of legal practice and throw technology into it in a way that helps us kind of shake the model up? Yeah, that's awesome. I, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting when you look at, um, traffic law, because you know, one of the things that is so problematic in the legal space, especially from a client's perspective is, you know, how's this all going to work out? Like, you know, what is this, what is this going to look like? And the more predictability that you can give to the client um, upfront and throughout the process, 
the more, you know, safe it feels, the more, you know, that this is kind of like, okay, you know, I can kind of let go of this situation. Um, you know, I, I understand what the path forward is. I feel like in so many areas of, of civil litigation and other aspects of law, it's just like, you know, here is maybe what could happen. And, you know, we, you know, we don't know exactly how this is going to play out. Here's what our strategy is or our next steps. But, you know, there's a lot of question marks in, even if it's not the situation that every county operates the same because they don't, if you get to know each district court, then you do have a certain level of predictability within within that specific space. And that is something that I think is a real, you know, selling point or, you know, kind of point in terms of, of client experience that uh, that can be capitalized on in the traffic space because predictability is really important. Like, how is this going to to be handled is really important. So I think that that is pretty interesting. That as you are looking at all of those different, um, you know, kind of handling a number of different cases, that was one of the draws because that predictability allows for systematization in a way that certain other maybe kind of areas of the law don't at least on the kind of outcome side of things allow for that same that same uh level of, of predictability so that's that's pretty pretty interesting yeah I, I think that if we talked about you know client expectations from the way that they want their representation to proceed but um, understanding you know what the preferred outcome is you know and driving towards that from the very beginning is really crucial for the client they they need to have an idea of, of how things are going to play out. And obviously, you know, it's, it's a no guarantee service. We're, we're seeking particular outcomes. We're not going to get certain outcomes. Um, but uh, for the client, you know, they don't want to call in and hear their attorney say, well, you know, we'll talk to the DA and figure out what's going on. Um, you know, that may work a time or two, but uh, clients generally speaking, want to have an idea uh, very from the very beginning where the case is going to proceed to. And so if, if you come in and you've got a triple digit, you know, 100, 115 and a 65, um, you know, it, it's better to be up front and say, hey, this is likely to be a uh, plea on the speed yeah. uh, where you're yeah. going to be the, 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 you know, the thing that we're going to be seeking is a limited driving privilege here versus, yeah, you know, we're going to take care of this. We're, we'll talk to the DA. We'll get it all figured out. I yeah. mean, you know, you, you may you may get some people in the door that way, um, but by the end of it, and you know, when the outcome is a plea on the speed and and uh, some sort of suspension leading to a limited driving privilege, um, that that assurance of we'll get something figured out isn't going to feel too good to the people. Yeah. So yeah, um, you know, we 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 lead with you know what we feel like is going to be the most likely outcome. You know what we're going to seek. And, and um, we let the client know that up front so that they've got a peace of mind as to, you know, what the goal is. And then additionally, we try to make it a reasonable goal um, that can be attainable. Yeah, I love that. I think that's so important. Well, in, in terms of kind of, I guess, flipping the script here a little bit from, you know, biggest drivers to kind of biggest growing pains, what along that kind of journey from, again, uh, uh, hanging the shingle, so to speak, to to the current state of iTicket, what have been some of the biggest challenges along that path? Yeah. So, um, and, and there, there've been a number, I, pro I promise you. <laughs> it's not, promise it's you all, this is, this is the way that I have learned the school of hard knocks, as I describe it is the, uh, the way that, that, uh, the, you know, momentum has come here. So. Yeah. It's, you know, it took a long time for that snowball that I was talking about earlier to get any <laughs> meaningful size. You know, I was practicing, uh, I was in a solo practice for about five years, uh, working on the technology behind iTicket. Uh, before we even started hiring on attorneys outside of our, you know, core counties that I was representing in. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of things that, have, you know, since that snowball has accelerated and, and we've, you know, continued our growth uh, path, some of the things that have, have really been challenges are um, initially just the diversity of the counties, uh, as we've talked about yes. the counties yep. and the districts that we practice in. Uh, growth itself is, a, uh, is, is always something you have to manage. You know, there, there's a, an adage that you can grow too slow or you can grow too fast. 
you know, and so sometimes growth itself uh, can lead to a company, you know, uh, declining and, and going out of business. And then there's just the changing expectations of our employees and job seekers. So uh, we were talking about just the counties, you know, there's 100 counties, we operate in 93 of them, you would think that, you know, justice is blind as, as the adage is, but realistically, um, every single county has got a different way of doing things. And that could be anything from how negotiations are handled to what offers are available, how court costs are paid and processed. Um, and you, you would think that, you know, in a unified system like North Carolina, that, you know, at least you could, there'd be one way that you could pay court costs, right? <laughs> yeah, but for that, sure. That's not the case. Uh, so across, across the counties, there, there are probably 15 different iterations of how court costs are, are taken in by the court and how, you know, and that that's always a, a problem, you know, because clients, um, unfor- you know, unfortunately clients, you know, the monetary aspect is generally going to be the hardest thing for them and uh, of, of the, the resolution of the ticket. And they may be working uh, up until the last minute to get those funds available for the court to pay the court costs. And they get it in a day or two late, or they send in a money order that has the wrong name on it. And the clerk sends it back through the mail and then 15 days or whatever later, they get it in the mail. And shortly thereafter, they've got a suspension letter coming from uh, the North Carolina DMV. And uh, so just the the varied uh, system um, by which we handle traffic citations in North Carolina is is really itself, you know, handling that's a Herculean effort. Um, Growth itself is is something that, again, it, it can it can once you start that down that snowball path, it can be shocking. You know, you, you go from uh, a certain number of cases one day to a, a, a larger number the next day. And you're like, whoa, OK, well, you know, I've got to triage these cases. I've got to get them out to the right attorneys. I've got to make sure that somebody's going to be in court, especially if they're signing up as, as clients sometimes do, you know, within hours. The of the 11th hour. Later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so you, you've got to make sure that things don't slip through the cracks because it's not just numbers. It, it's a person, you know, it's a person's life. And you know, you know, we don't, maybe we don't think it's all that much if, you know, Susan loses her driving driver's license, but you know, what if that causes her to lose her job and then her, her uh, rent can't be paid and she loses her house and she loses her custody of her children. And it's, uh, you know, it, 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 you know, there's, there are good snowballs and then there are bad snowballs. And um, if we don't handle our cases appropriately um, because there are too many or whatever it is, um, you know, that, that really affects people's lives. Um, and then just uh, changing employee expectations. We talked about culture. Culture matters. Back in the day, um, you know, it was it was kind of my way or the highway for the for the attorney. The attorney was always right. Legal assistance, uh, you know, they were they were in their place or whatever. That's not how it is today. Um, uh, you know, the the legal assistant wants to feel like they're a part of the team. They they do not want to be told what to do. They want to be helped and educated through the process. Um, and uh, th- additionally, you know, younger people who uh, make up a good a good percentage of our legal assistance that I took it, they're transient by nature. You know, they're they're here in in Chapel Hill one day and Charlotte the next day, and then Phoenix, Arizona the day after that. And yeah. uh, they've got to have something about the the company that uh, makes them want to come in every day, that makes them want to sacrifice to be a part of uh, of, of something bigger. So uh, those those have been probably the the three biggest things that we've we've had to combat over the years. Um, you know, just to continue on our our growth trajectory. Yeah, I think that that you know that initial growth space is is so difficult, and I think as you're you know uh, not only handling your own caseload, but then also trying to kind of get another you know, attorney up to speed or you're growing your team, um, you're sorting through cases that another attorney is going to handle, but still like kind of managing your own, uh, your own caseload. What did that, uh, process look like in your particular situation in terms of kind of moving from, you know, being the person that's running all over the running all over the place, you know, hitting four counties a day, five counties a day to kind of, offloading that onto, um, to other attorneys at the firm. Cause that is a big, that's tough. You know, it's, it's a, it's a tough thing to, to grow because there's just this, uh, uh additional responsibility when you kind of tend to, to keep what you already had still on your shoulder. So what, what did that look like for you? Yeah. And I, I think one of the hardest things for me in, in terms of that aspect was I just really enjoyed district court practice. You know, <laughs> I I'm, agree. I, yeah. I'm a, a, gre- a gregarious guy. I, I'm very sociable. <laughs> I like to be out in district court. 
Um, but over time, it, it just became more and more apparent that my skill set was better utilized in the office, making sure that our, our cases were being handled appropriately across the board rather than just in the, the few counties that I was continuing to maintain coverage over. And, um, you know, some of that is, is uh, just making sure that you have the right people. Um, you, you, you have to feel like that you can trust the people you're working with. Uh, to be able to offload something. And as uh, you know, I'm, I'm fairly OCD, fairly perfectionist oriented. So that was, that was a really hard hurdle for me to mm-hmm. overcome was just letting go, you know, letting go of, of that control, you know, with the real, you know, with the knowledge that, you know, the person that you're going to put in your place is probably going to make a mistake or two here or there, but that's the only way that you learn. You know, I made quite a few mistakes as I was coming up through, you know, the great thing about district court is pretty much anything that you you know mess up, you can you can fix pretty easily. Um, and so um, you know, just kind of having that realization that, you know, they've got to cut their teeth, too. You got to give them opportunities to, to, to thrive. And sometimes that means opportunities to, to fail as well. Um, so, you know, just in, in terms of, um, you know, the operational size of the firm. Um, we, we have, you know, our, our CEO, Tom Cool, who is just an amazing guy. And I, I think he might get on the podcast at some point in time in the, in the future. He, he, he does a great job of, of running with our, with my assistants and with the assistance of our staff attorneys, our administrative, uh, legal assistants. Um, but, you know, there, there's something about attorneys. They want to, they want to talk to an attorney, you yes. know, and so if, if, if an attorney is, you know, needs, needs some refocusing, there's, there's an issue with the way that the case has been handled. They need the managing attorney to be the one giving them a call and walking them through the process of how to get back on top of things. And so, you know, with the number of uh, counties we're in, you know, having me in the office on a daily basis in that role as managing attorney, solely as managing attorney, not operating any counties on my own, it became more and more, um, you know, imperative uh, just just to keep the, you know, keep the tribe going on the same direction. Yeah, no, I think that's that's super helpful. I mean, I think I think that uh, that's something that most lawyers that are wanting to bring on an associate, um, you know, higher level potential partner, really kind of like wrestle with is you know how um, uh, you know h- how is that how is this person going to c- kind of be able to function in my in my in my role particularly, especially if you're not just bringing on somebody in like a new area, like how is this person going to kind of take over? And I think it's, it's, it's really kind of like a trust of being able to let go of the wheel. Cause it can get really uncomfortable if you're just kind of in there dictating everything and you don't let, you know, don't let that, uh, that attorney kind of sink or swim as you, as you kind of described it. And again, doesn't mean you don't provide education and support, but everybody's going to do it somewhat in their own way with their own personality. And, and, you know, the more that you let that to me shine through, the better off that is for the attorney in terms of being able to kind of develop their style of representation at that kind of local courthouse. I, yeah, I, lo- I love all those points. Um, in terms of like the technology aspect, and you know, you talked about this being something that really was kind of from the get go important on your end, and you know, you spent a lot of time developing the technology that would kind of, I would say, allow you later to snowball at a faster rate. I mean, it was, it was, a, you know, it sounds like both from our prior discussions and then today that that was kind of a um, really, really thought out process of, of how can we develop the software? And obviously it's continuing to develop, but really going into it, like this is something that's important um, you, you've described to me a couple of times, uh, I take it being, you know, a tech company that delivers legal services. So just talk a little bit about like, what do you, what do you mean by that? What, what, what does that look like? And then, um, you know, what, uh, what is the, the vision of your company, you know, in, in terms of being a tech company in the legal space, what does that vision look like? Yeah. So, um, and, and we talked about our CEO, Tom Cool. Tom, Tom had a background. Um, uh, what, what, a fun, what a fun person to hang out with. I mean, he's, oh, he's, uh, he's the best. A wonderful so. guy. <laughs> and like I said, I, I'm hopeful that he'll, he'll have a chance to come on to the podcast at some point in time in the near future. Definitely. Uh, just it. to give that, that, you know, non-lawyer business perspective yeah, yeah, in, yeah. In, in terms of uh, how the firm is operated. 
But, uh, you know, he describes us as a, a customer service company that happens to practice law. And t- our technology is, is a huge part of, you know, how that, that process works. And just kind of circling back to um, the formation of the company um, and, and, you know, those, those years kind of in, in, the, in the desert or, or however you want to describe it. it. It's not dissimilar from like, you know, uh, Bill Gates or, you know, another startup like operating out of their, out of their garage while they're putting the, the product together. You know, it was, it, was, it was five lean years where pretty much every dollar that I had was going into the development of, of the software product that I, you know, may, may or may not have ever, you know, hit the, hit the, you know, the market. Um, it, and there, there were times where I would, you know, come home and talk to my wife um, and just say, Hey, honey, I, you know, it's, it, we only have 30 cases this month, you know, and, and she's, well, are you, are you, are you moving forward with, with the dream? You know, you're moving forward with the product and yeah, we're doing it, but man, it's, it's, it's rough today. And uh, so shout out to my wife, Caroline, because she was yeah, a so huge important to have somebody that is supportive like that. I mean, it's a huge, yeah, a huge advantage. I mean, I mean, you can't even like uh, understate that enough. How important your your spouse partner being on board with your with your dream is. So that's yeah, that's awesome to hear. She always says that she she always saw the that success was coming. I was like, I, I wish I did. <laughs> that's <laughs> good. There, there were there well, that's was great. A lot of times where I did. <laughs> Um, but, um, but so, uh, you know, kind of focusing on, uh, you know, how we see ourselves, um, our software is, is kind of built with a singular focus and that's to to deliver an incredible experience for the clients. And it's an incredibly stressful time for them. So we spend a a lot of time and effort on that software to make sure that the process is seamless from the very beginning. And we're constantly evolving our simple, our, our system, implementing new features, to kind of ease that that transparency of the experience for the client, um, and, and act also to increase the efficiency on the administrative side, so there aren't lag points in in the representation. Um, so we 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 want to have a system that as soon as the client calls in, you know, number one, we know exactly who they are, and we know exactly where their case is at. And if we don't know exactly where their case is at, we can get in touch with the attorney super quick and get them up to speed on on where things are. But um, you know, in terms of you know things that we've we've rolled out over the last number of years, you know, automated reminder emails about tasks outstanding in the case for the client. We've got text messaging reminders that come out you know on a weekly basis for the clients to keep them up to speed about where things are with their case. We've got a, a client case portal on the back you know that the client can come into. See any tasks outstanding, upload documents to the case profile uh, so that the attorneys automatically get those, um, you know, wherever they are. If they're in court, they can see that a new out-of-state driving record or registration document or whatever has been uploaded into the system, review it, get back to the client super quick. Because there there's a lot of downtime in the district court process where our attorneys, you know, aren't in the office, but they have time that they can be working in, in, on their casework. Um, and then we've got a back-end verification system for uh, through the North Carolina court system that makes sure that we know exactly where the case is in terms of its hearing date. Um, sometimes clerks, you know, put in the wrong hearing date or otherwise we, we, we're on top of that immediately as soon as we identify it. And then we've got performance tracking of all of our administrative assistants and our attorneys um, so that we know, you know, how they're performing against our own expectations um, you know, in terms of uh, timeless, timeliness of communication with the client. Um, and then we're working right now on, on AI integration into the back end of the system that's going to, you know, I think even further uh, snowball the efficiencies uh, uh, that we've been t- discussing. But our technology, we feel like, is a, is a real difference maker. Our people huge, are a huge yeah. difference maker, but, but our technology is a real difference maker in the level of service that we're able to provide for the client. And so we focus on that pretty much every single day. Yeah, I think you know w- one of the focuses at our firm over the past several years has been to basically kind of um give the client a wow experience and it's taken us really kind of diving into the details and I would say we're still kind of very much on the early stage of this uh trying to kind of create a metric system, a measurable system for how do you evaluate whether you are actually delivering wow experience? It sounds great to deliver a wow experience to a client, but until you can kind of say what that is and then have some means of actually measuring, did we 
do these things that we we set out to do, you know, answer a call within 30 seconds, have the case, you know, um, uh, res resolved within the time frame that we promised the client, uh, you know, follow up with the client, you know, uh, at, at, you know, every 15 or 30 days or whatever it might be, you know, until you have that, you know, very detailed and spelled out and then have some means of, of seeing, are we hitting these marks? It really is just nothing more than some, some nice verbiage, which I, I would say for us, that's kind of where it's, uh, stayed for a pretty long time, and only recently are we really starting to kind of try to drive into dive into the the measurability of those things. But I mean, it's just again, it's an awesome thing to hear how important that is to what you all are doing in terms of being able to really use that as a measuring device for are we are we delivering the way that we want to deliver? And I think that it can be perceived as like a um, you know, it can be perceived as a, uh, uh, you know, uh, Hey, you know, uh, I'm, I'm being, you know, having somebody look over my shoulder, I'm having somebody track me all the time, or it can be, you know, perceived as this is the way that we ensure that we are delivering the service that we want to. And, you know, the way that we can improve it. I think a lot of, a lot of team members, um, in most businesses, this is not true of just law firms, but in most businesses, it's hard to tell whether they are doing the job that they, you know, that they're supposed to be doing, whether there's like places to improve, you know, am I, am I actually, um, you know, operating at the level that I sh should be like that. It's very difficult to tell whether you're performing well. And so I do think that there is a like comfort level in having some sort of like a measurable, this is what the kind of goal is. So that it's like, okay, now I've got something to shoot for where I can see if I'm succeeding or or not. So I think that's a huge, huge point. And I think increasingly, you know, firms like iTicket um will will really rise to a, a greater level of like differentiation from other law firms as people kind of get to this place of expectation of uh, kind of feedback, communication, notifications, texting, you know, communication in the form that I want to engage in, whether that is texting versus a phone call, you know, the more that you are are kind of responding to the client need, the consumer need, you know, the way they're experiencing other businesses in the service industry, the more that you're going to be like, this is this is how I'm used to interacting with a business is, you know, that I can text them and, you know, the, you know, they'll send me a message right back versus I'm calling a firm and they, you know, th there's no voicemail. I can't, I can't leave a message. N nobody picks up the phone. Like, it's like, this is not how businesses that I interact with operate. So I, I think it's a humongous differentiator. And, and you know, we have, we, we don't, uh, you know, in the legal space, we, we were able to come in and, and disrupt with these, these thoughts and processes because the legal industry has just for so long operated under that kind of almost like 18th century mindset of barristers and, uh, you know, the, the, again, the attorney knows best. Um, but when your competition, you know, from a psychological standpoint, not necessarily a market standpoint, but your con when your competition is Amazon or Amica or these other businesses where you, you call them and they answer the phone by saying, yes, Mr. Jones, how can I help you today? Yes. You know, and they automatically know what's going on with your situation. It, it's really hard to be in a, in a place where, you know, you, you call a, a law firm, you've called six times and you finally get somebody on the phone and it's an assistant who, who you know, she's, well, let me uh, go and, and find that manila folder somewhere yeah. in a drawer and uh, shuffling papers. And, oh, yes, of course. Uh, yes, we know exactly what's going on. There's there's just a level of, um, you know, la a lack of, of feeling like the, 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 that the firm is on top of things. And whether or not that's the case, you know, is not necessarily doesn't the matter. issue. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter if the attorney in court knows exactly what's going on with the case. If the client can't get that information from the attorney or from the legal assistant, then it doesn't matter. Um, so you have to, you have to, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, a about creating that trust and trust is, is created through continuous data points throughout the entire process. So even if you answer the phone great the first time, you know, if the, if the next six times don't happen, you know, you, you've lost that trust.
Yeah, I, I think that, you know, that's one of the, you know, maybe in the criminal defense space in particular, I think one of the reasons why there hasn't been like a, you know, quicker kind of keeping up with kind of uh, corporatization, so to speak, uh, in, in the business business space is that it is literally, you know, for the longest time been, you know, a bunch of solo practitioners, small law firm uh, groups. So it's basically, you know, this, this, uh, a bunch of small businesses that are operating and really kind of, you know, only competing against so many other small businesses in their individual space, you know, in smaller counties, maybe only four or five other firms that are really doing a lot of traffic ticket and criminal defense work, um, you know, in larger counties, maybe a lot more than that, but still, you know, everybody's kind of operating in this very, you know, solo and small business picture. And I think one of the, one of the things that's so valuable about a, um, a business like iTicket in the legal space is that it really kind of just calls everybody to raise the bar. Like as technology improves on, you know, uh, on, on your front at, you know, on the iTicket front, it really is, it's kind of like, okay, everybody else is now kind of expected to raise the bar, so to speak, in their individual uh, level in order to try to kind of like be competitive. Right. And so I, I think that that's one of the, the, the beautiful things to me, there's, I have a, uh, you know, I have a, a real passion for, you know, our criminal defense, traffic uh, defense brothers and sisters in the bar because it is damn hard doing this work. Like, I mean, it is really yes. tough work, yeah, and and is. so it's it's a, uh, I mean, it, it's it's grueling, it's it's you know tiring, frustrating, you know, it's 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 uh, you know work that you know, will make you at points want to beat your head against the wall. I mean, it just is it's tough work. But I think that there is a real value in having a a company that is the size of iTicket because it allows you to be creative and inventive in the legal space in a way that being a solo just is really tough from a time management side of things. So I think that there is just a huge um, creativity leverage point that happens once you start to really look at the the tech side of things. So again, I, yeah, I, 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 that's not really a question, but I don't know if you have any additional thoughts in terms of, you know, kind of what you've seen in the legal space and kind of, I would say maybe a, a void that I ticket has kind of filled that really just has called other firms to kind of up the game. Yeah, I, I and I uh, I completely agree with you. And just in terms of how difficult the solo practice life is, and and that was I think the thing that took the longest uh, to get I took the I ticket snowball rolling. Is I was I was in that same solo practice game, and at the same time trying to develop the software and et cetera that became I ticket. And so you're doing everything at once. You're working 12, 15 hour days, sometimes trying to get back to clients and make sure that they're up to speed um, uh, with the, the status of their case. I will say that things are different, you know, or a little bit better off for solo practitioners now, just because the ubiquity of technology in the marketplace, yes. it, it, there are so many different solutions. We talked about air call, you know, as a, a solution for phone answering services. Uh, there's a, a great application that you can have both on your on your uh, phone as well as your computer called Slack that is kind of almost like AOL Instant Messenger when we were kids, you know, <laughs> just a way of keeping in touch with your team uh, through you know wherever they are if they're in you know Buncombe County or um, out on the coast, you know everybody's up to speed at the same time through through this technology and um, it's you know text messaging or applications like Slack allow the client or excuse me allow the attorney to be present and reachable, even when they're in the middle of a district court session. You know, so if, as you know, I mean, if we're not right in front of the judge, we've got generally a little bit of leeway to be on our phone or step into a back room. Um, if you can't take a call, you can certainly answer a text message or pull up your uh, pull up Slack on your phone and, and reply to a message from your legal assistant. Uh, asking, you know, hey, what's the status of the case today? Or have you seen the client who's supposed to be in court this morning or, or what have you? So um, people are better, off, you know, solo practice attorneys are better off today than they were uh, when we started, where we had to basically make the wheel uh, for ourselves. 
Um, you know, if you're not using technology, if it's uncomfortable to you, that's going to be a thing that is definitely going to be a hindrance to your success in a solo practice environment. Um, and, you know, one thing to just to think about, about, uh, you know, tickets or criminal defense in general is that, you know, for the longest time, it was considered to be a loss leader. It was basically something that got through, got the clients through the door so that then you could represent them on a family law matter or a real estate matter or what have, have you. So you weren't expecting to make a lot of money on it. And that's still just a really, really difficult thing to do. Um, uh, tickets uh, specifically, you know, if you spend 30 minutes on a call with a, a client about a, uh, a 80 and a 65 traffic offense, um, it, it's going to be hard to claw that back into the range of profitability. And so you have, there have to be ways that you find efficiencies uh, in your system. And so, for instance, like, you know, we have a, an intake process that can be done completely online. So a, a huge percentage of our clients uh, never speak to us on the phone at all. And so, you know, if you are literally talking on the phone with every single one of your new clients, uh, not only is that usually inconvenient for them, they may think they enjoy it. Um, but generally speaking, they've got other things they need to attend to, whether it's making breakfast for Jimmy or whatever it is, you know, that that time on the phone is something that if you can if you can move to a digitized system for intakes, you know, even if that's just a percentage of your of your new cases coming in, that's a that's a huge time saver that can can allow you to to look at this as something that can be profitable for you. I mean, and while we, you know, we're attorneys, we've got all sorts of ethical obligations to our clients. At the end of the day, we've, we've got to pay our bills at the same time. We've got to make yes. sure that we can keep the lights on at home and at the office. And so you, you can't run your business solely thinking about the ethical obligations. I mean, those, those have to underpin the way that you work, but, but if you only think about that, you know, and not the amount of time that you're spending on each one of these cases, you're going to be in the poorhouse pretty soon. And so um, it, it's just it's something where you have to kind of come at it from a business perspective or otherwise it's going to be you know, a losing proposition for many people. This kind of is along the same same track. And I mean, you, you just pointed out a couple of like places where solo and small criminal defense lawyers are going to have to to pivot. Is there anything else that you see change wise coming down the pike in terms of, um, you know, solo and small criminal defense lawyers and anything else that you see kind of changing in the marketplace? Yeah. I mean, there are two different things that I think are going to be huge um, uh, forces for change, you know, over the next few years. Um, one of them is technology related and, and one of them is, is just kind of uh, regulatorily related or if, if that, I'm not sure if that's the right word, word for it, but um, you know, we've talked about, and it, it hasn't hit out out West yet, but uh, e-courts. E-courts is going to be yes. a huge, a huge change factor uh, for our district court practice. And, you know, the court system, and I think uh, rightly so, feels like that the uh, that defendants uh, need to have more access to justice. That is 100 percent accurate. And attorneys also need to have more access to the court system uh, virtually. We don't need to be at the courthouse uh, to do every mo file, every single motion, et cetera. So e-courts is, I think, a great thing for the progress of justice in our state. But if you are not a person who is already leaning into technology, if computers are not something for you, eCourts is going to be a huge hindrance to your success moving forward. And it's it's taking time to roll out, um, but we're we're going to be opening up, and it's going to be opening up into Orange and a lot of the counties around the Triangle just in the next few months. It's yep. already taking over District One, which is like seven counties out in the east. Um, that's starting like February fourth. And by 2025, it's going to be rolled out through the vast majority of the state. And so we have a lot of attorneys in district court who are still practicing um, on the Manila, Manila folder basis of law. And if, you know, they are going to have to either get up to speed or think about, you know, moving into a different area because e-courts is going to be a huge change. And it's going to be something that is, especially during the rollout, is going to require a lot more time in district court than you have ever experienced. Yeah. Um, we, you know, our courts and our clerks and our judges and our DAs um, are very, very used to the way they do things with the shucks. It's very easy to write an IE onto a shuck, pass it to the clerk, and get it up to the judge. Uh, when all of that has to be done electronically, you would think it would be faster, but depending on the Wi-Fi signal in the courthouse, it can actually take 10, 15, 20 minutes 
And if the person who's running the negotiator is familiar with e-courts, you know, you could be you know a situation where you would be in and out for two or three cases, you know, in a matter of a few minutes, you know, that could end up taking an hour or two or maybe even half your day. And so during the rollout of e-courts, people are going to have to just, you know, expect delays. You know, it will get better. That's what all of our attorneys are saying who have, have been through the process already in Wake County and Mecklenburg County. It just takes time. Um, but then you have to be willing to, you know, accept that technology is now going to be a part of the game with e-courts. And then yeah. in terms of just, just changes, to, just the, to pause yeah, you sorry. on that for one, for one second, Dan, because I do think yeah. that e-courts is such a big kind of fear factor for a lot of lawyers and, um, you know, has been obviously like a huge pain in the butt for lawyers that have already had to go through it. And I, I think, you know, kind of went when I, when I've, you know, first heard about e-courts and, and I still kind of have this like, uh, hopefulness about it. It's, it is something that seems like it would allow for easier systematization from, from a practice perspective. And obviously, again, this doesn't, doesn't change the fact that it's been maybe poorly rolled out in, in several counties that, you know, uh, clerks, judges, DAs, defense lawyers, people in other practice areas were not kind of ready to utilize the technology, but I kind of see it, you know, from my perspective as one of those growing pain points where, you know, what within your own firm, there have been times like whether you're like doing a software change or some sort of process change where in the first couple of weeks of implementation, it's like, this is, this is rough. People are like, we should just go back to doing it the way that we did it before. And then as things kind of, you know, uh, you, you make some tweaks and you, um, figure out, you know, oh, we weren't, we weren't using this part of the, uh, uh, you know, system, the way that we were supposed to be proceeding forward, it, it really, you know, obviously plays out to be this, this humongous, uh, point of, of, uh, advantage. Um, but again, growing pains exist. And I think that this is one of the, the way that I see courts currently is as that like kind of growing pain process. Like it, it's extremely, it's excruciatingly painful in the moment to kind of figure that out. But I do, I do have a a high hope that in the long term it will be really beneficial to uh, criminal defense lawyers that you know again fully embrace it to clients in terms of speed and and um, ability to get things done, um, you know just at a different pace than we can do currently. So I, I just wanted to you know before you moved on to the your, your second point, I just wanted to kind of you know uh, agree with you on that front. I I, I think that there. There is a uh, reason to still, in my opinion, be optimistic about e-courts long term. I, I totally agree with you. Again, it's just a, it's just a growing pains process. And the one thing that I keep telling all of our attorneys, you know, when they when they're kind of right in the mid, in the thick of it, is I say, just remember, everybody in the courthouse is going through it at the same time with you. So, yeah. you know, uh, while while we're you know <laughs> you don't want to be similarly in hell but if you are it's great to be with other people right yeah. so i mean <laughs> that's right. you know we're, we're we're all going through it at the same time and um so you know clients it's something you've got to educate the client about and just say you know there's going to be a little bit more of a delay in how we're handling this this case at this time because of this rollout you got to be forthright about the situation just let them know up front and they'll be accepting of it because they'll call another attorney if they you know they'll say yep i, I agree i was in court with him <laughs> yesterday and, <laughs> and so just you know maybe bring a magazine or you know whatever get you, you know get your uh, fantasy football league up on your cell phone um, <laughs> because there there will be some some downtime uh with the rollout of e-courts but the good thing about it is that you know there are already a number of st uh, counties that have implemented it so things are getting better um, every every rollout that we've seen seems to have progressed some in some way and, and be moving a little bit faster. So again, it's just growing pains and, and we, we will all get through it. But if you aren't going to, if you are refusing to lean into technology, life is going to be even harder for you uh, moving forward as a solo practice practice or small firm criminal defense firm. Um, but the second thing, and we talked about is, is, and again, I think these things are great for the uh, furtherance of justice in North Carolina. Uh, but we, um, the state has started to roll out a number of new public defender offices throughout the uh, throughout the state, and I can't recall if it's seven to, or ten uh, new public defenders offices that are uh, being opened up over the next, you know, uh, few months. 
Um, but these are going into counties and districts where they have not had public defenders offices previously. And um, that's great because it's going to uh, really ensure effective defense for uh, indigent clients th throughout North Carolina. The flip side of that is that for solo practice and small firm criminal defense, um, so much of their uh, kind of, I don't want to say guaranteed revenue, but so much of their, their revenue for in many cases is coming in through indigent appointed uh, cases. Yes. Yep. And so, you know, if 50 to 75% of your revenue for your firm is coming in through indigent appointed and a, um, and a new PD's office opens up in your county, um, you know, you're, you're really going to be at, at, a, at a loss. Um, you're going to have to figure out, like, how can I either differentiate my service, uh, up my level of service, open up new areas of practice, potentially move into the PD's office yourself. Um, but, you know, you can't necessarily look at conflicts cases, which, you know, I keep talking to attorneys who, who are, well, I'll, I'll, you know, there'll still be plenty of conflicts cases. Uh, conflicts cases are going to represent a small, small percentage yes, they will. if you have, if you have, you know, generally relied on 50 to 75% of your income coming in through indigent appointed cases. So I really want uh, solo and small firm attorneys out there to just think about this. You have to be ahead of the game. Um, you can't be just on the back foot responding to this change in your local market. And, you know, there's still a lot of uh, North Carolina that's, that does not have a, a public defender's office, but for these, for these new counties that are going to be receiving them, the attorneys there are going to have to face some difficult choices moving forward. And um, that, that's just the, that's just uh, the reality of the situation. And, and the sooner that you kind of appreciate that, um, the sooner you can start moving forward in a proactive way. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, uh, again, there's, there's definitely, you know, benefits and burdens from the criminal defense side of things. Again, I think one of the, um, one of the, benefits of it is that basically again it requires you i think as a as a criminal defense lawyer in private practice to almost by uh mandate up your game again it's kind of that same thing like you know there's got to be some sort of differentiating um you know service that you are bringing to the table as you know the law practice by technology, by a public defender's office, maybe becomes more commoditized almost. I mean, it, it's it's one of those things that you have to figure out, you know, what is the specific criminal defense niche that I am kind of, uh, you know, sinking my teeth into? What is the, you know, kind of unique communication abilities that I have with my, um, with my client? What is that kind of specific advantage? And I think, you know, again, as we, as we, you know, are thinking through these things and what the the future of criminal defense looks like. It is it is my hope that we really engage as a criminal defense bar in how do we improve the practice, the business of criminal defense lawyering, because that's the only way to me that you're going to uh, continue to get you know the best and the brightest attorneys. I mean, it, you know. Uh, that, that are already in that criminal defense space to continue to be attracted into that there, there you know, it can't be something that just, you know, uh, ends in burnout and poverty. It's gotta be something where, you know, we, we as a criminal defense group are, um, you know, uh, being able to be fulfilled in our professional lives and our personal lives, um, you know, not just, not just earn a living, but be successful. I mean, I think that that is really important to, um, to us as a, as a defense bar. So, I, I mean, again, I think to both of those points, to me, it's my hope that like, again, this, th these kind of conversations really, really spark a kind of more global conversation of how do we, again, as a group, up the ante because again, I, I feel like we deserve to. So that you know, it's 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 partially again just that that feeling of camaraderie with, um, you know, our brothers and sisters that are in criminal and traffic defense. Um, it's 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 a hard life, but I think that we can can make it more fulfilling and enriching um, if we if we kind of work together and have conversations about that. Well, they, you know, they say that uh, a rising tide you know, raises all boats or something yes. like that. You know? yeah, and I, I, I truly, I truly believe that, you know, yeah. I, I think that 
you know, looking, you know, while we obviously need to differentiate ourselves um, in our in our service or whatever, you know, we don't need to look at our at each other in the district courthouse, uh, at, you know, or district courtroom as you know competitors only. You know, yes. we're resources for one another. Uh, so many of us are going from county to county to county and not having a brother or a sister out there who can help you out when you need a continuance because you're, you know, you woke up sick or whatever it is. I mean, it, it's hellacious. You need to, you know, we need to be giving towards our, our fellow members of the bar. And so I absolutely 100% agree with you. And uh, just to the point of differentiation, I wanted to say, I mean, we've talked uh, about I take it, you know, for about an hour, about five minutes now. But, uh, but you know, to the to the point of differentiation, you have just done a great job, Jake. And uh, Minic Law is is really become, you know, a uh, a focal point for DWI defense in the state of North Carolina. Uh, you guys are incredibly trusted um, for the service that you provide in DWI defense. And I, I'm, I'm glad to have you as a friend and as a resource, you know, for uh, both me and my attorneys as we work through our DWI case casework. Um, the things that you guys do to separate yourselves in terms of your focus on trial practice and trial skills development has just really uh, inspired me, you know, in terms of things that I want to be putting in place for our own attorneys. And then the way that you've been able to connect with the consumer uh, through podcasts like this one, I think is, is just revolutionary, at least for the legal space. And so I just wanted to say, you know, congrats to you as well, my friend. I mean, you, you really are kicking ass out of here. I appreciate that. I, uh, no, I, I think it's, it's, um, you know, I, th I think it's, again, you know, it took a long time to, to find the space of where, where we were going to, niche down. And, and, you know, I think, you know, I, I veered from that, you know, at one point into, you know, not only kind of, you know, plethora of other charges, but outside of criminal law altogether. And ultimately that was confusing for everybody that worked at the firm. It was confusing for clients. Um, it, it made, it made, uh, education as a group difficult. And so I think that, you know, being able to focus on DWI really has, from an educational standpoint, been incredible for our team. I mean, I think that our our staff uh, at the firm, I would say, probably knows more about you know DWI related driving privileges and timeframes than most criminal defense lawyers across the state, and that's just because of the amount of times that they are you know dealing with these kind of situations. And so, you know, I, I think it really does. Um, help in terms of that side of things and and also uh invite to to any of the i ticket lawyers as well as to uh any of the listeners we're doing a um kind of public mock trial day at campbell law school on march the 8th uh from 10 to 3 we've got two uh dwi uh trials that that our team's going to be working through but we're encouraging other lawyers to come in and um, you know, kind of be be a part of that uh, experience, feedback. It's you know, it's really more of a a learning opportunity than um, than anything else. But uh, yeah, definitely trying to continue the the educational war path on that front because it's it's it, you know very important. Um, so yeah, no, and, they, I, and they, I will say just just to break in a second, I will say I mean you know, there's a conference of DAs, like <laughs> you know right. they they don't they don't look at each other as competition. That's and, right. That's uh, they true. look at us yeah. as the competition, that's and true. so um, they work together to up their trial abilities. They've got the same handbook that they're working off of, you know, and so we're we're almost you know at a loss here because we're trying to do everything by ourselves or in our own little silos, and so. Um, you know, of course, I, you know, I, I love my ADAs and, and no, no shade on them, um, but we don't need to be looking at each other solely as competitors. You know, we, we are operating in a market, we're competing for, uh, you know, the same clients, but at the same time, if we don't ally up, at least in some respect, uh, then we're at a huge disadvantage against our real competition, which is the state. So, yeah, 100%, 100% agree on that front. So, I um well I I think as as we are kind of closing uh, closing out on the conversation, um I, I'm gonna kind of leave you with this with this question slash thought experiment. You know, if you if you could go back um 15 years to uh, to young uh, Dan Hatley, you know, coming out of law school, you know, in in, in construction litigation and other other areas of law, and uh, you know all all of this knowledge that you have now. 
what would you say, um, you know, uh, to your younger self, what would be kind of the advice that you would give to, to your, uh, your, uh, newly, newly licensed younger self? Well, there, there are a lot of, you know, business related, uh, things that I would have changed about the way that we got started. But I think the main thing, um, just in terms of uh, mental health and personal satisfaction was that I tried to fit myself into, kind of a a round peg into a square hole for a really long time. You know, when I was going through law school, I was always wearing tie dye t-shirts and I I was kind of a class cut up and stuff like that. (laughs) And that, you know, you, you you get out into the the legal field and, you know, everybody's in a suit and tie and there's a particular way that you're expected to uh, act. And, and I mean, decorum in the court is, is of course important, but, you know, when I started growing my hair out, you know, there one one or two particular judges, you know, would upbraid me on a regular basis uh, in open court about having a you know a, a hair up or a bun or whatever, and uh, you know uh, that, that and that's fine, of course, you know uh, they're coming from potentially a, a different generation, but I would just I would have encouraged myself just to you know maybe be more true to who I was yeah. earlier. It took me a long time to feel comfortable being myself in the law. And um, as you can see today, you know, you know, I've had a chance to come home from the office and, and sit down and put on, you know, something a little bit more comfortable. And uh, this is what I'm, you know, this is who I am. And if, if, if people aren't, you know, appreciative of it, well, you know, they're, I appreciate that, <laughs> yeah. but I'm going to be who I'm going to be. And, um, you know, we have a difficult role as uh, criminal defense attorneys. Like we are taking, uh, incredibly serious problems under our shoulders for our clients, and if we can't be comfortable in our own skins, um, we're, we're that burnout that we talked about is going to come so much sooner. So you have to be able to come home, put the hair down, put on a comfy tie dye T shirt every once in a while, and just be be yourself. So that's what I would encourage. You know, my younger self, but even younger attorneys in the law is. Uh, don't don't feel like that you have to fit into a particular mold. You know, as long as you're doing a great job for your clients, that that's what matters. Um, and and if the older attorneys in, in the courthouse you know give you a hard time about it, you know, politely shake your head and, and move on with your day uh, because how you feel about yourself is the most important thing. I hundred percent agree. I think it's one of those things where, um, again, if you're if you do everything you're a master of none, right? Like in the, in the practice area space, you know, that's, that's one of the benefits of niching down. If you don't stand for anything, nobody like knows how to pick you out of the, out of the, you know, potential pack of attorneys that are in the, in the area. If you stand for something, not everybody's going to get on board with that, but there'll be a good amount of people that are like, you know, that, that I can connect with this person. You can't connect with somebody that doesn't stand for anything. And I think, um, you know, both in terms of your demeanor and persona in the courtroom, I agree. I, you know, I, I am, um, I'm not an aggressive person by nature and I tried to kind of be a pit bull in the courtroom, uh, early on in practice as I was trying cases and it felt really uncomfortable. And I'm, I'm sure watching it from like a third party perspective, you're like, you know, either that guy doesn't know what he's doing or he's just, you know, like, you know, weird, you know, I mean, it, it, mu- it must have looked like, you know, a strange, strange thing. And, um, you know, I, I now kind of take much more of like a, I would say almost like curious approach in terms of like trying cases. It's, it's, you know, you know, tell me what you mean by this, you know, th- you know, uh, explain this thing to me. And it, it, it's, it's a much different persona and other lawyers at the office have very different you know, kind of trial personality. Some of them are pit bulls, but they come by it naturally, you know, like this is, this is who they are. And so I think that, you know, yeah, recognize, I a hundred percent agree. Like when you recognize, um, you know, uh, being, being able to bring your personality into your office is a humongous advantage. Like, I mean, again, it allows, you know, if, I, I think that there's there's people I've seen online, lawyers online that have posted, you know, pictures on their website with their with their dog of their family, you know, uh, you know, I support the Carolina Panthers, like whatever, whatever it might be. Like, I mean, whatever that thing is that it's like, oh, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's something that, that, uh, you know, we can, we can make a talking point over. You're giving the client the ability to connect with you as a person, which when you're trying to build 
a trust relationship is huge. So I, I 100% agree with that. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Yeah, um, and and I totally agree with you. I mean, there there are certain clients whose expectation when they come into the to the office is that there's going to be an attorney in a three piece suit across the desk from them. Um, but for a person who's just gotten off a job, you know, laying concrete all day, and they've got mud on their boots and everything like that, it, that's a pretty uncomfortable situation to walk into. Uh, you feel, you know, totally at a disadvantage to the other person, and maybe maybe the attorney likes that power dynamic, but I can tell you that the client doesn't. And so when the client comes in and they feel comfortable that you're a person, you're not just an automaton in a suit, um, that you're giving them uh, a, a portion of yourself and your communication. I mean, that that really makes a difference in the connection that's established. So I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, well, I, I love it. There's there's nothing more fun than talking, uh, talking the business of law. And nobody, nobody better to do it with than you. So I really appreciate you coming on and uh, letting us kind of get an inside look at at iTicket, explaining um, to the audience some of the changes coming down the pike for us in the criminal defense industry and, and sharing your knowledge. I can't thank you enough. It was my pleasure to be here, Jake. And I'll be up in Asheville, uh, you know, sometime in the next few months. And hopefully we can uh, catch a lunch, uh, Taco Temple while I'm up there. Yes. Yeah. I just was there yesterday. So definitely I'm, I'm, I'm all about it. All right, my friend. Thank you so much. And I'll, I'll look forward to talking to you soon. Sounds good, Dan. Take care.